No? Now. Now. It's good. OK. Um, is it all right if I stand on the right? I'm going to move. Um, <laughs> OK. So um, first, thank you all for coming back from the coffee break. Um, and what I want to do is give you today really a basic introduction to x-ray spectroscopy. Um, but before I do that, um, I want to identify your x-ray tutors. I'll also be there for, I think, at least six of the sessions, so there'll be more time to discuss then. Um, but if you want um, more discussions as well as any help with um, the software, these are um, all group members who can help you. Uh, Rebecca, Ben, and George will be there for the tutorials. And Casey um, also could be particularly helpful with the Demeter installation since it can be a real pain on the Mac. Um, so just um, encouraging you to take care of the software installation so we can focus on um, actually uh, analyzing data during the workshop. And so this week, okay, it's only the second day, but it's been a whirlwind. So I realize you guys have already been through the entire electromagnetic spectrum, basically. You already covered EPR, Endor, NMR, Raman, MCD, MOS power. And so basically, this is what's left, <laughs> at least in terms of <laughs> spectroscopy. Um, and so we're now still in, in the high energy zone. So um, this plot is a little bit misleading. We're really talking sort of on the order of hundreds of electron volts to even many of tens and thousands of electron volts. This will really depend on our source, what we can do with this. And as many of you know, um, if we're talking about applying X-ray spectroscopy to biological systems, historically that has been done with synchrotrons. So some of the earliest X-ray spectroscopy was done in the, on biological systems was done in the late 1970s. Um, and that was done with early synchrotrons at places like Chess and, and Cornell, at Cornell and, and, and Stanford um, SSRL. Um, and these sources are, are typically um, relatively large rings, um, close to the size of a running track, that accelerate electrons to relativistic speeds. And as those accelerated electrons cruise around the bends, they lose energy. And they lose energy in the form of really intense x-rays. And so just to give you a, a general idea, these x-rays are going to be about on the order of a million to a billion times brighter than what you find in a conventional lab x-ray source. Okay? And so um, this is a plot of the photon energy versus the spectral brightness. And the spectral brightness is basically um, the concentration of x-rays, how many uh, x-ray photons we have in, in a given area. Okay? And so the brightness of modern synchrotron sources, or x-fels, um, is incredibly high. We're getting something as much as 10 to the 22 photons in a tiny little spot. Okay? Um, and worldwide right now, this is a map of all the synchrotrons in the world. There's about 60 of these sources. Um, and so I often joke with my group that this is an opportunity for travel. Um, my, 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 group, my group does experiments presently in North America, Europe, and Asia. Um, but so far, no one's convinced me to go to Australia yet. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, OK, but, but this is also changing. And so um, I, I used to sort of allude to this in previous talks, but this is now reality. Um, you can, if you have an extra 100000 to $200,000 laying around, um, buy um, your own easy XFS instrument from in the lab. These are comparisons of synchrotron um, zanes and emission done on the same instrument. Um, it's produced by Jerry Seidler's group out of University of Washington, and his slogan is excess every day in every lab globally. So um, we'll see how that works. Um, we bought one of these instruments, but due to European regulations, um, it has yet to be delivered. We're still delayed due to CE regulations. But, but you know, it's, it's getting there, and we're excited um, to have a, another instrument in-house. Um, but today, what we're going to talk about really is plain old vanilla X-ray absorption and XFs. So some of you, um, particularly uh, people who are from my group or former group members, might be a little bit disappointed. Maybe you're interested in hearing the latest in uh, resonant valence emission or 2P3D RICs or, or, or XMCD. And, and my group and I were all happy to talk to you about all of those possibilities, but later. Um, right now, we're going to focus on regular old K-Edge XAS and XAS. And um, the reason in part that I'm doing this, um, most of my group will actually tell you, I actually hate XFs. Like, I, I, like I mean, I'm supposed to teach you that. And I, and I thought about, why do I dislike XFs? And it's not the method's fault. It's actually quite a useful method. The reason I have an aversion to it, and maybe many of you do, is there's a lot of bad XFs out there. And I'm not going to pick on these papers today. That's no fun. We're just going to talk about how you analyze XFs correctly so that you can sort of, you know, prevent People, yourselves, your friends, 
from publishing bad XFs. Okay? And, and then together as a community, we can sort of improve the reputation of XFs. And so um, to, to do XFs, of course, you, you need to understand a bit about X-ray absorption in the edge. This is really important because as we'll talk about, the X-ray absorption part can help you constrain and better define what you can get out of XFs data. Okay? So let's talk about X-ray absorption. I already told you that this is a method that uses intense X-rays. And so what we do is we come in with an intense source of X-rays and we use that to ionize core electrons. Typically in biological XFs, we're going to look at, for first row transition metals, we're looking at ionizing 1S core electrons. Okay, most typically. So for a copper K edge, we're going to ionize the 1s electron, and that's going to take about 9,000 electron volts of energy. If we want to do this at iron, that takes a little over 7,000 electron volts of energy. These are huge separations, right? Remember, an electron volt is over 8,000 wave numbers. And this large separation in core ionization energies of the elements is what makes X-ray absorption selective. So you can absolutely measure any element you'd like to measure as long as your X-ray source um, has sufficient photon flux at that given energy. Okay? You can, of course, also excite other core electrons. This always is happening in your experiment. It's just the probability that's varying. right? But we can also excite 2p electrons. For copper, that takes about an order of magnitude less energy. Or we can excite 3p and 3d electrons, and that will take even less um, energy. But as I said for today, just think about k-edges and 1s excitations. That makes a life a lot simpler because we don't have to worry about spin-orbit coupling and all those nasty things you see in MCD, okay? So for now, uh, we're going to keep it simple. Okay, and so let's just talk about the basics and a little bit of nomenclature. When we talk about X-ray absorption spectroscopy, we're talking about doing a very simple absorption experiment, frankly, in a lot of ways, very similar to UV-Vis. Um, and we're just looking at the modulation of the X-ray absorption coefficient mu as we increase the energy in our experiment. Okay? And so what happens in a typical X-ray absorption experiment at a metal edge is that we start at low energy. At some energy, we have um, enough energy to ionize the core electron. That results in this sharp discontinuity that is known as the edge, or it's often referred to as the X-ray absorption near-edge structure, or Zanes, you'll hear in a lot of papers. Okay? And this primarily gives us electronic information, but it also gives us some geometric information. Um, and then after um, we ionize the electron to the continuum, this is the extended X-ray absorption fine structure region that gives us metrical information about what's around that absorber, how far away are the atoms from that absorber. Okay? So for the first part, though, let's just focus on the information we can get out of the edges. And before we do that, let's just look at the experiment in a little bit more detail. Um, as I said, this looks pretty much like um, a typical um, optical absorption experiment. There's just a small difference in the source, obviously. The, the source is an X-ray source. And you're going to use a monochromator. So this was already nicely explained by Oliver. We're going to use Bragg's law here and lambda equals 2d sine theta. And we're going to change and scan in energy with our monochromator to get the right incident energy. And that's how we're going to vary the energy, most typically. There's other ways to do this experiment, but we won't talk about that today. Then we'll measure the incident signal. It'll pass through our sample, and we'll measure a signal after. This is normally just done with gas-filled ionization chambers. We would then have a reference foil, so a metal foil, that would serve as a constant energy reference, and another ionization chamber behind it. If you have a very concentrated sample, that's how you do this whole experiment. You rotate the sample 45 degrees with respect to the incident beam. You can also measure fluorescence processes. Okay. Um, and I'll describe this a little bit more later. But the nice thing about doing these X-ray experiments, particularly at high energies for the K-edge experiments we're talking about, is that this whole setup is in air. Okay? So this makes the sample environment a lot more flexible. As we decrease the energy of the X-rays, we have to start to enclose the environment in something like helium or maybe a high vacuum system that's going to absorb the X-rays less. And you can imagine for many biological samples in solution that there's another reason why we want to be at these high energies. Also, it turns out that high energy um, electrons are far less damaging, right? Because they actually um, don't get as absorbed in the sample. They have a much longer path length. That means they damage less. Okay. But this is just what I was already talking about a little bit. You have to keep in mind, whenever an X-ray 
hits your sample, there are so many things that are happening. In fact, the thing that's most likely happening is it's getting scattered, right? But there's some probability it will be absorbed. These are the events we're looking for. And the probability of that absorption event happening, of course, becomes much greater when you are right at the ionization energy, right? And that's where we're measuring the edge. Um, and we either do this in direct absorption or transmittance if the sample is concentrated enough. Otherwise, we follow a secondary process that occurs after I created that 1s core hole. Now, it could be that after I create that 1s core hole, for instance, um, an electron is admitted from the same level. This is a so-called Auger process. Okay? Or it could be that an electron from a higher level refills the core hole and emits a fluorescent photon. At uh, 1s uh, sort of k-edge energies for first row transition metals, the probability of a fluorescence or an OJ event is actually about equal. The reason that we measure fluorescence events is it's a lot easier. Electrons have very short mean free paths, and a fluorescent photon has a longer mean free path. And so this just makes our life a lot easier. There's other fancy things you can do with those fluorescent photons that um, I won't talk about today, but, but um, I'm happy to, to discuss with you during coffee breaks. Um, so for users at beam, beam lines, um, this is something that's becoming increasingly black box. So they often come with a sample, put it in, get out of spectrum, go home. Um, it's, it's not quite like crystallography that's mail-in, but it's, it's becoming more routine, right? And so often users aren't aware of what's even happening upstream, but I want you to just have some idea of, of what's happening. So I already told you that we're getting our x-rays from this, this synchrotron ring. And within that ring, there are various insertion devices. Okay? These are things called undulators or wigglers that, that you may um, hear of if you ever go to a synchrotron. But they're basically magnets that sort of bounce the electrons, uh, or bounce the photon beam back and forth to increase the intensity. And then with those X-ray photons, we actually use X-ray mirrors. These are also um, typically crystalline optics that have a coating. And we operate them near a grazing condition where we basically can um, maximize the um, external reflection that we get. Okay? And we use these, these sort of called X-ray mirrors um, to basically um, shape the beam to, um, to vertically or horizontally focus it. Or maybe we can play with the angle to get rid of harmonics. So that's we use these mirrors upstream. And then we also have the double crystal monochromator that I already told you about. Um, and we might have another focusing mirror, some slits, and then it enters the experimental hedge. Now, one thing I just want to tell you about here is that these monochromators, as well as these mirrors, are taking a very intense heat load. Okay? So that means that oftentimes the heat of the beam is so great um, that the monochromators are often liquid nitrogen cooled. That gives you a sense of the power of these photons. And if you were to mysteer this beam, this is an example of a commissioning gone wrong um, <laughs> at Stanford, where um, while they were commissioning the beam line, they steered the beam only momentarily, four seconds, into copper shielding. And when you saw it later, the copper had basically just been totally destroyed. Okay. Um, and so if you think about um, how powerful this beam is, one of the things you want to think about when you study biological systems systems by X-ray absorption is that photoreduction is a huge, huge problem. And this is not something that I'll cover in detail today. Um, this is actually, as an X-ray spectroscopist, the most common number one question I get after every single talk. Did you look at photoreduction? Um, and I hope so. If any of you do X-ray spectroscopy ever, please, 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 the first thing you do is to spend time seeing if your sample changes as a function of X-ray dose. That's your obligation. You're not allowed to do anything else before then. Okay? Um, I think this was something that uh, it took a while for the community to embrace this, but this should now be old news, and we're happy in the tutorials to show you what happens when you put too much dose on your sample. What's the plus side? Um, the plus side is, is, unlike in crystallography, they also suffer the damage, but Ollie didn't tell you about it. Um, <laughs> um, but, but the plus side is relative to crystallography, we can look at samples in any form. So they can be solids. Um, if you want to lie, alkalize your protein, that's fine. They can be liquids. They can be frozen solutions. Gases probably aren't so relevant for biological systems. But um, the, the point is, is that um, absolutely any sample form we can measure. And unlike optical methods, like if anyone has done MCD and you've struggled to get a great glass or something like that, frankly, for most of these experiments, we don't really care or need that. Okay? There, 
Sometimes ice diffraction can be a problem, but there are ways around that even. Uh, the sample concentrations, though, um, can be more of a problem. We typically tell people we need millimolar in the concentration of your absorber. So um, don't think about the concentration of your protein. Think about how many absorbers you have per protein. That's what you want. And that should be around a millimolar. That said, um, there are experiments that have been done in the tens of micromolars. That's possible, but challenging. It's limited not only by signal to noise, but also by available beam time. So typically, you don't have a week to just let something measure. Okay? Um, and the nice thing is, is that if you have a focused beam, you can do very small volumes on the order of microliters. Um, but if you have a very small beam, you'll probably destroy what's in that microliter pretty quickly. So the volumes can become quite a bit larger, depending on the rate of damage. And I will say that that varies for every system that you look at. So the manganese site of photosystem, for instance, is notoriously susceptible to damage. Things like nitrogenase, um, you know, their job is to accept electrons, but they don't actually like to take it from the beam. Um, not nearly as much as they like to take it from their own reductase. So this is interesting. Biology is, is complicated, and the actual process behind photoreduction is something that we still don't fully understand. OK, but let's just briefly take a look at these edges. So I already showed you that the edge was that sharp discontinuity. And really what this edge is is a dipole allowed 1s to 4p transition. So this is a transition with a delta L of plus minus 1. So s to p is allowed, and you get a lot of intensity. Now, if you think of something like a D5 iron 3, of course, there are other transitions below the 4p that are allowed. And those are transitions into the unoccupied 3d levels. Okay? But this is now a 1s to 3d transition, a delta L of 2. So it's dipole forbidden, but quadrupole allowed. And there you can see how much weaker the quadrupole transition is relative to this dipole transition. Um, and basically, it takes distortions in symmetry for this pre-edge to gain intensity. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about. I'm just going to briefly run through what you get through these edges, um, because these edges can tell us things about oxidation state, coordination number, covalency, and 4p mixing. And before we talk about excess in more detail, I want you to just have a flavor of what you can get from the edges. OK, so let's look at some examples. So what we can see here is um, as we go from copper 1 to copper 2, um, so from blue to red, we're increasing the effective nuclear charge of the copper. It's becoming more positive. It makes it harder to pull a 1s electron away from it. And then what happens is this edge goes up in energy. And the same thing would happen, for instance, if we compare iron 2 to iron 3, although the overall shapes of these edges at each element can be somewhat different. The other thing I want to emphasize is that the shape of the edge will also depend on the coordination environment. So this is a case, um, this actually should be relabeled, this is an iron uh, tetrothiolate. And if we compare this tetrahedral iron tetrothiolate to ferry and ferrocyanide, although, although both edges shift up upon oxidation, you can see the overall shape and the absolute energies are dramatically different. Right? So I can't just look at this and say, oh, look, it's at 7120. It must be iron 3, because when I go here, my iron 3 is up at 7130. It's 10 electron volts different. And so when you compare x-ray absorption edges, you really need to compare things that have somewhat related coordination environments. Otherwise, these comparisons are meaningless. Okay? Um, for most x-ray absorption spectroscopists, though, uh, there's enough literature and sort of fingerprints out there that that sort of a card-carrying X-ray spectroscopist would see this edge and pretty much know it was a tetrahedral sulfur complex. Yeah, Chris, you would know that, right? Good. Okay. See, Chris is a card-carrying X-ray spectroscopist, so he's a, okay. Um, and and the, there's a very different and distinct shape for for things like cyanides. Okay. Okay. The other thing that edges can be dependent on are coordination number. And here I chose probably the nicest example. Um, it doesn't always work out this cleanly, but copper 1 has particularly um, beautiful edges that are highly coordination dependent, and this has been nicely used in, in bio and organic chemistry to determine the coordination number around copper 1. And of course, this becomes a unique method to look at things like copper 1 and zinc that aren't otherwise readily accessible. Okay, and so what we're seeing here now, of course, is copper 1 has a filled uh, 3D10 uh, ground state. And so these transitions represent 1s to 4p transitions. So if you could imagine um, an isolated copper ion, you would have um, a threefold degenerate transition to a 4pxyz. But if the copper 1 becomes too coordinate, and through antibonding interactions, we raise um, the energy of the PC, 
then we can sort of, in a simple picture, assign this lowest energy transition to, as a transition to a doubly degenerate PXY with the PZ buried in the edge to higher energy. If we bring in another ligand now along Y, um, so the PYZ plane is here and is degenerate, then the lowest energy transition is to just a PX, and it has about half the intensity that we had for the two coordinate. And instead, if we go to a tetrahedral copper one, we raise the energy of the 4PXY, and that becomes buried in the edge. And so you can use these simple ligand field-like models um, to sort of get a, a picture of what's happening with these edges. Um, this slide I won't go through in detail. I just wanted to point out that um, in, this is a, an example in blue copper, um, where you actually change the axial, mute, um, the axial ligand from a glycine um, to a methionine, um, or you can look at it relative to a, a mutant where you remove the cysteine. And you can see that as you change the covalency of the amino acids, there's also subtle effects um, on the rising edge. And this um, basically is something that arises from shakedown transitions. So there are uh, secondary processes that may be superimposed on the rising edge. And so, um, again, these edge shifts don't mean that the oxidation state changed. If you look at the pre-edge, it's actually the same. Um, but we have additional 1s to 4p plus ligand to metal charge transfer that also shifts this. And um, I won't go through this, but this can be sort of explained using a valence bond configuration interaction-like models. Interestingly, this is a region of the edge, though, that we don't calculate particularly well still. And maybe an example that sort of further emphasizes what happens to the edge is to look at three different iron threes. Um, these are now, of course, infinite lattice materials. But when you have fluorine, chlorine versus bromine, you can see that um, more covalent as well as heavier scatterers like bromine, the edge shifts down. And this is something to, important to be cognizant of. The pre-edge doesn't really move much. And so this allows the pre-edge in many cases to be a better independent um, indicator of oxidation states at times than the edge. Um, these scattering effects from heavy atoms on the edge can be very large. And so that's something that, that we need to actually be aware of. The nice thing is, is though, that the pre-edges are much more predictive. And so um, basically, um, we have very weak pre-edges for octahedral. And this all comes out of group theory, right? So in an octahedral limit, the d orbitals transform as t2, g, and e, g but the 4p orbitals transform as T1u. And that means there's no symmetry allowed mixing in the octahedral limit. The intensity that you see is pure quadrupole. Okay? And when we lower symmetry and we go to tetrahedral symmetry, we now have both d orbitals as well as p orbitals that transform under that point group as T2. They mix by symmetry, and you can see group theory in action, the pre-edge goes up. Right? And that's why these pre-edges provide us with local symmetry information and oftentimes coordination number information. And so this is information that before you do an excess analysis, you should absolutely use to inform um, what you have. These pre-edges have led to a lot of standard paradigms in the bio and organic world. So for instance, the idea that um, sort of non-heme proteins, for instance, with weak pre-edges are often signed as six coordinate. Um, an intense pre-edge is often assigned to five coordinate. Um, similarly, um, it's led to the metric that the pre-edge increases by one electron volt per change in oxidation state. So this is what happens as you go from iron four to five to six. This is a pretty extreme example from model chemistry. Okay? Um, and so these are fingerprints that you can use. Um, but I just want to point out that you know, if you have a six coordinate site that becomes highly distorted, so here we have a bidentate nitrate that prevents the site from going rigorously octahedral. It will actually gain intensity and can have as much intensity as typical five coordinate sites. Okay? Um, similarly, you can have iron four and five that have the same pre-edge energy. And this happens in this case because the iron four I show here is six coordinate and the iron five is five coordinate. So they have a different um, effective um, D manifold energy that changes the relative position of the pre-edge. Um, the good news is, though, that we can actually calculate these pre-edges very well these days. So this is just an example of what I already showed you, a comparison of the ferric tetrachloride to ferric hexachloride. We can calculate both the quadrupole and the dipole components, and we can do this for large ranges of compounds. So this is something that's been done before. Um, and all I want to sort of emphasize here in this last part of talking about the edges is that pre-edge calculations can actually be used in a predictive fashion. So you can look at 
sort of series of model complexes. You can look at your enzyme of unknown structure and use this in a predictive way to say, is my model consistent with my data or not? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, there is. Well spotted. So there's a discrepancy in the actual calculated energies. And that um, I didn't actually put the correlations here, but we basically know that um, as the, the charge actually increases on the species, we do a poorer job of compensating for that with, in this case, using simple sort of solvation models. And so this is kind of a known problem that the areas we calculate are more accurate than the energies we calculate. And there are also improvements in this range. So the calculations I'm showing you are sort of the, the simplest time-dependent DFT, um, but there are certainly more sophisticated wave function-based approaches that are now also improving the energies. Um, and so that is something that you can discuss with the um, ORCA uh, team as well, because I think they'll be doing some extra absorption calculations. Great. OK, so I have 15 minutes left to do XFs. Man, OK. <laughs> I'm still too slow. And I cut slides. Um, OK, so um, what I want to talk about is getting geometrical insight from um, XAFS data. And once we get to the XAFS regime, we're out of our comfortable space of thinking about a molecular orbital picture. Because we need to think now that we're not doing a transition to a bound state, but instead that this electron has been ionized to the continuum, and it's now propagating out. So it's a photoelectron wave and it propagates out from the photoabsorber, and it gets bounced back by a neighboring atom. And when those waves from the neighboring atom return, they can um, interfere in a constructive way that gives you a maximum, or they can interfere in a destructive way and give you a minimum, or various ways in between. And these interference patterns will vary um, as a function of energy. Um, and what we want to do is to actually extract structural information from this interference pattern. Okay? And it turns out, of course, that we don't just scatter from a single neighboring atom, but we can also have multiple scattering from many atoms. And we'll talk about that more later. Um, but the idea is, is that this excess can give you information about distances, um, actually quite accurately. So at least near neighbor distances, as good as 0.01 to 0.02 angstroms. It can give you information about coordination number, although with larger error types of ligands. Um, and, and some information about near neighbor and, in some cases, bond angles. But the important thing to emphasize is that XF sees the average of everything around the photoabsorber. Um, and so it's over. Um, <laughs> so let me, I think I have to go back to my computer to do this. Sorry about that. It also won't let me see it from here because my display is in the wrong place. Hmm. This is not, it's not cooperating. One sec. OK. Maybe I'll stay closer to my computer now in case it decides to do this again. Um, so basically, if you measure excess data straight off the beamline, um, what you typically do is you measure the full edge, and then you scan past, way past an energy. So you can see this is not unusual to go about 1,000 electron volts past the edge. And probably if you're looking at this and you've looked at excess in papers, you don't see anything here that looks like excess, right? You don't see any wiggles from a distance. And that's because we actually have to extract that, okay? And so we have to first do a pre-edge subtraction. You guys will do this later. And then we have to spline the data. The idea with the spline is that we're removing the atomic background. So this would be the idea that if I had an atom in the absence of backscatterers, it could still scatter off its own potential. And that would happen at a very low frequency. Okay, so we, we model this with what we call a spline, which is basically low order polynomials knotted together to give us that low frequency background. And we do this initially in energy space, but eventually um, we go from something where we hardly see any XFs to something now um, converted from energy to K space that gives us the classic XFs and the Fourier transform. Okay? And I'm going to go through this um, a little bit more detail mathematically on the next few slides, but this is just to sort of show you that. We, we see these sort of intense wiggles. And because if you're not a crystallographer, you don't think in reciprocal space, and you don't like looking at things in, in reciprocal angstroms, we generally like to Fourier transform this and look at the radial distribution of um, scatters relative to the photoabsorber. So when you look at a Fourier transform, what you're looking at is you're thinking about the photoabsorber sitting here at zero. And in this case, we're looking at an iron dimer where we have a lot of things around two angstroms, and then here, a lot of things around three angstroms. 
And just as crystallography has a phase problem, XS has a phase shift problem. And that phase shift problem we'll talk about um, a little bit more later. Um, but the, the basic consequence is, is that you cannot read distances directly off a Fourier transform. So please don't do that. Um, it's not allowed. OK. Um, so um, let's just talk briefly about getting this out. So what we need to do is we start with chi of e, the signal that we measured. We need to subtract that spline. And we also need to normalize to an edge jump that's normally defined at some E0 position. E0 is the origin of your photoelectron wave vector. Um, and so when we define E0, this actually allows us to convert from um, energy space. So this is what XS would look like if you plotted it in energy space. You can see the waves are all compressed. So part of the reason for conversion from um, electron volts to K space, um, this photoelectron wave vector unit, is you can stretch out the excess, OK? This is the actual equation for doing that. Um, so it's basically just the square root of 2 me e minus e naught over h bar squared. e naught, though, is something undefined. We don't actually know where the origin of our photoelectron wave vector is, but it's somewhere around the edge or so, right? And that means it's something that also we have to fit. OK, and then because these oscillations die out at high k, we typically k cubed weight this. Um, and oftentimes, we want to get data as far out in k as we can. But sometimes, especially with disordered biological sites with weak scatters, getting very high k data can be a serious challenge. So it's um, a limitation. OK, so let's look at um, sort of how we can think about this a little bit more mathematically. So I already told you we have our absorbing atom. It backscatters, and it, re it produces some sort of phase shift in the outgoing wave on its return. So the way to think of this in a simple scattering picture is to think of your outgoing photoelectron um, that can be modeled by this exponential. And there will also be a returning photoelectron. But it can't be the same unless it's scattered off nothing. And so what we have to do is basically modulate um, that scattering by both um, an amplitude parameter, f of k, um, and a phase parameter, delta k, of the neighbor that that wave encountered. Okay? And so this modulation basically um, leads to um, the, the sort of standard excess expression where we multiply this out. And the square of this exponential um, using Euler's theorem can then be expressed as a sign. And we basically express this in terms of the coordination number and the distance of atoms um, and also um, the amplitude and phase. And this is just for one atomic site with no disorder. Okay, so this is as simple as the XS equation can get. Um, but then typically what we need to do is also to um, have some sort of disorder parameter. This is sigma squared that we introduce in this exponential. And this is the mean squared disorder in a bond length. This is the so-called de Bywaller parameter. Okay? And so um, if we look at a generalized XS expression then, what we have is n representing the number of atoms of type, of type j. And so the more of a given um, atom we have around a photoabsorber, the more it contributes to the total signal. Um, and then we also have the specific amplitude um, and phase parameter um, for a given atom type. Um, and you can see here that we have this 1 over r squared dependence. Now, for those of you um, who aren't Frank Neza and don't instantly visualize what all of this looks like, I want to put this um, in simpler terms for the rest of us. And this is just to show you visually what's happening, right? So, Basically, these are all iron-oxygen scattering paths at different lengths, right? And so if an iron-oxygen is very short, it gives a very high amplitude in the excess and a peak in the Fourier transform at a little below two angstroms. Um, you can also see then, as I go further out in distance, I increase the frequency of that wave and I move it further out in, in distance. Okay? This all comes from this simple expression of the excess equation. So um, if instead, I change the coordination number. This is the easiest one to understand. If, as I go from a coordination number of 1 to 2 to 3, I linearly increase the contribution to the Fourier transform. OK. Now, if I change the backscatter identity, um, and so this is really the, the much larger effect that we see in this, um, because what we see here is that the oxygen actually results in a relatively small um, sort of amplitude. and a weak contribution to the excess signal, whereas sulfur is much greater, and another iron would be even greater. And this is all at the same distance. Okay? So if I think of an iron oxygen at 2.5, it's not going to be a big contribution to my excess. But another iron iron, that should be. Okay? And so 
If you need it even more visual than that, um, this is the picture, right? So it's basically that the carbon is minimally modulating our photoabsorber, but um, we better be pretty good at identifying an amplitude modulation by another iron, right? Okay. Um, so the problem with all of this, though, is um, what I hope to, to cover in the next few minutes, at least, is we, we have the Debye-Waller factor. We have this disorder parameter. So it's not just about coordination number, but it's also a question of how disordered my site is. And so um, the Debye-Waller factors, um, you'll often read in papers that a well-ordered system will have a small, small Debye-Waller, so something like 0 0.001, and as you increase disorder, that value um, increases, um, and that decreases the contribution. Um, this Debye-Waller can represent thermal disorder, but it can also represent static disorder. And I'm actually going to, to skip over a little bit and um, I'm not going to talk about temperature dependence. This is the, the dependence of, of temperature on, on the Fourier transform. It's also dramatic. Um, but I want to just spend the last few minutes focusing on the question of, of static disorder and resolution, because these are really important problems in XS analysis. And so here, um, what you see is, is the resolution of your XS goes as pi over 2 delta k. So the further out you get XS data, um, you go from a Fourier transform that's relatively unfeatured to getting XFs further out where you start to see things sharpen and you start to see contributions that weren't there if you don't get data at high K. And the impact of this is, is that with data of a short K range, so typical K ranges we get for biological XFs are something around maybe 11 to at best 15 angstroms. We often are dealing with resolutions of something like 0.1 to 0.2 angstroms. Okay? So relatively poor resolution. It means that I'm not separating out an oxygen at 2.0 from even maybe a nitrogen at 2.15. And that's because they're similar scatters. They're both light atoms that can't modulate that outgoing wave from the iron very strongly. And that means um, we, we don't get a strong signal from them, but we also can't um, separate them well. Okay? And so I wanted to comment on this a little bit more. If you had a rigorously octahedral site with all of the bonds exactly at two angstroms, you might fit a relatively small Debye Waller. That would make sense. The problem is, is biological active sites don't look like these perfect models that we draw. They actually have a lot of disorder, right? And when we look at these biological active sites, in this case, on um, the bridging carboxylates and the bridging oxygens and, and the coordinated nitrogen of the histidine, it's very likely these won't even be resolvable. And these contribute to a great amount of disorder in our data. Um, on top of that, we don't have the disorder just in the first shell, but we have the disorder due to multiple scattering. So this idea that the photoelectron can scatter off other atoms, um, and that all of these produce different multiple scattering pathways. Okay. And so the important question to ask is, is, what does all of this disorder mean for actually fitting your XFs data? And so here I just kind of want to give you a picture of this. this we typically, what you're going to be using is the program FEF. It's sort of the program everybody uses to, to calculate XFs. And what that program calculates is you put in a model, and it calculates all of the, the, the distances and, and um, coordination numbers that come from your input model. But it also calculates to buy wallers, as well as scattering amplitudes and phase shifts, as well as a mean free photoelectron path. And for this iron dimer that I showed you before in the XFs, a single iron has 98 paths, each with um, three different parameters. So we basically, if we include both irons and all three parameters, we're, we have many more independent parameters than we could ever possibly fit. Okay? This is just the, the Nyquist uh, equation for sort of the limit on your free parameters. But for most XS data, especially biological XS, we have maybe something like 10 free parameters or so that are allowed by our data. And, um, many, many more that are calculated. And so these have to somehow be grouped to avoid actually overfitting um, and to understand how that impacts your data. And so there I just wanted to comment um, that what we calculate with FEF is effectively just one part of the Debye-Waller. It's the thermal part for a given motion. But what we also have is a large static disorder component. And that static disorder comes based on the resolution of our data. So we actually, as I already said, if we had um, different irons at, at a range of distances, we would need to look at the deviation of each distance from the average. And um, this is a, 
a case where we would effectively double our Debye Waller relative to what you calculate in a simple model. Okay? Um, and so I want to just sort of skip ahead and say, what are, what are the consequences for this in terms of excess? The problem is, is that probably all of you know you can find papers where we can fit excess. I can put in this manganese model, generate parameters, allow the parameters to refine, and the excess looks great. Um, but the question is, can I predict excess, right? And here's an example of that same monomer data in black and predictions using either a crystal structure with the correlated Debye or geometry optimized structures. And you can see, at least in the case of this monomer, they come quite close. Um, what we see is very small errors in the distance, so less than 3%, but still large errors um, relative to the calculation in the Debye Waller on the order of 30 to over 140%. Okay? Um, and when we go to more complicated things like a dimer, so again, here's the experiment and the fit, and here's the attempt of calculations to predict the excess. And although the distances, again, are quite good, you can see the amplitudes and the ratio of these amplitudes are all wrong. They're all over the place. And this, again, reflects um, incredibly large errors in our ability to not just produce absolute to buy wallers, but relative to buy wallers. And so in my last minute, I just want to say why this is important for problems in bioinorganic chemistry, okay? Because we often have these disordered sites, and there has been a long history, for instance, trying to use XFs to favor a certain model for photosystem, and this is an example where various groups, who will remain nameless, have, have championed different structures, and they've all used the argument that my XFs data prove a given structure is correct. And if you take the experimental data and you take every, any one of their models, you can see that the only error would be in just scaling the intensity, just in changing this Debye Waller. But in fact, XFs can't prove any one of these models. All it can say is it's consistent with. Okay? And that's a really important take home message. The only thing that the XFs really helped us with, and this is what I want to point out on the right, is that if you looked at the, the crystallography, so what it did show, the original um, crystallography here, this is in blue, this is the original XRD structure um, from Amina at 1.9 angstroms. If you compare it to the XFs, you can see the distances are way too long. So clearly the XFs supported that that crystal structure was photoreduced. And in fact, even in the, quote, damage-free XFL structure, the XFs show that the XFL structure is likely photoreduced. So the strength in XFs is getting good distances. But the take-home message is that XFs really need to be fit, and it cannot presently provide topological information because our ability to predict the Debye Wallers is not yet good enough. And with that, I will close. So.